Well, hello there. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to D4, D&D Deep Dive. This is the show where each week... <laughs> uh, that was really stupid. Each week, we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers about them, not with the intent to tell you the right way or the best way to play a character necessarily, but to explore one potential way to build them and play them in the hopes of creating something that is both really powerful, but also, more importantly, really fun to play in-game. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D, almost as much as you enjoy playing the game itself, or you're just looking for tips or ideas on a character that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong. It really is, and I'm really glad that you're here. So thank you for being here. Uh, my name's Colby. Really quick, if you're interested in having a step-by-step -step cheat sheet right up to this character that I've built or any of the other characters that I create for my channel, I would appreciate it if you would consider joining as a member. There should be a little button down there that you can click on that says join. For $2 a month, you get access to my library of write-ups that lets you have that cheat sheet step-by-step -step guide for recreating the character without having to go back and rewatch the video. But also, it's just a really nice way to support the channel and help me create more and better content. So huge thanks to all of my channel members. You guys are awesome. And for everybody else, you're also awesome. And don't feel obligated. Just watching and liking and subscribing and commenting are all also great ways to support the channel. So thank you, each of you. All right. Let's just jump right in. In case you hadn't noticed by the title, today we are going to do a Shadow Sorcerer. I've had a ton of requests to build a character around this subclass, and I've put it off for a long time because I just couldn't quite decide what aspect of the Shadow Sorcerer I wanted to build around. But as I dug into it a little bit more this week, one thing really popped out to me. See, as I've sometimes talked about before on other builds on this channel, when I decide to build a character around, whether it's like a particular subclass or even like a specific race, or maybe even sometimes like a specific weapon, I usually will look for the thing that feels the most unique about it and try my best to find a way to get the most possible use out of that unique thing as I can. So for example, that might be the ability to grow large without casting a spell, like in the Rune Knight's case. Or the fact that the dart is the only weapon that has both the ranged and thrown properties, like we took advantage of in the Needler. Or more recently, the way that the revised new to mom, uh, Monsters of the Multiverse, Bugbear race gets to do extra damage if you go before your enemy on the first round of combat, like with the Gloomstalker. With the Shadow Sorcerer, they have some cool and fun features, no doubt. Some defensive, some more utility or mobility focused, but I think the thing that is most unique about them and that offers a potential advantage over other spellcasters actually comes from their level six feature, the Hound of Ill Omen. It gives us something that will make creating them as like a burst damage or Nova damage character really, really attractive. And that is fitting, I think, considering the flavor and theme of a sorcerer who is a creature of like shadow and death, right? Quick refresher, when I build characters focused on doing damage, I will put them into one of two categories, either sustained damage per round characters, DPR, who are meant to be able to just put out solid damage round after round, they're nice and dependable, or Burst damage, also called Nova damage, we use those terms interchangeably, and Nova damage characters are built to blow a lot of resources over a short period of time in order to, ideally, take out one or more enemies early on in the combat so as to turn the tide of a battle in your party's favor quickly. I happen to think both types of characters are valuable and fun, but yes, I do think that the Shadow Sorcerer particularly shines as a Nova character. So. Let's see if we can take that one little unique advantage we get and just stretch it as far as we can to see what we can do with burst damage here. And that's all I got for the preamble. So I proudly present episode 95, The Shadow Sorcerer. Big thanks as always to my friend Randall Hampton who creates 
fantastic artwork for each character concept that I send him every week. He does a fantastic job. He captures the feel and flavor of the character perfectly every single time, and I love it. And in fact, like, this might be my favorite piece that he's ever done. I mean, look at this. Like, the the hound just coming out of like the shadow like that is just oh my gosh that's so good wow if you would be interested in following randall or reaching out to see if you might be able to commission him to do some art for your character or your party even i will as always put links in the video description on how to do so also before we jump into the build i actually wanted to take a moment to read the description for the character kind of pairs nicely with the art that randall drew that the team over at describe has come up with for the concept this week as they are again the video sponsor the target looks tough able to absorb a lot of magical power so the sorcerer conjures from the deep arcana of bestial history a composing shade it writhes into a great wolfish form a hound of ill omen trailing shadow magic as it charges the foe as the hound draws near its target the spellcaster feels the sorcery of lightning of blight of all magic subject to resistance the crushed will of an opponent no longer slow to fall they totally nailed it. They always do. For those who are not familiar with them yet, Describe is one of my favorite tools out there to enhance my TTRPG experience, particularly D&D, of course, for me. They create professionally written descriptions of pretty much anything you could ever want a written description for in your game, whether you are a DM or a player. So yeah, settings, characters and objects sure but also the casting of a spell or an insult you might hurl at your enemies written from the first person perspective so you can just read it right off the screen at just the right moment but you know over the past few months as a lot of you know they've become so much more than just creators of like box text, right? They have professionally illustrated maps replete with evocative descriptions of each point of interest that shows up on the map when you hover over it with your cursor. They've teamed up with really incredible artists who are ready to create beautiful renderings of your character for a really reasonable price. And they even have growing selections of poems and songs that range from silly to somber for those times that you really just need to have a good bit of verse in your game. When they sponsored one of my videos, for the first time a few months ago. Describe only had a few thousand entries in their library. They're now past 7,500, which is at least double in only a few months. The quality and quantity of the content that they're constantly creating is just so impressive. And I love how much of it they make available for free to anyone who signs up for a free account, which you should totally do if you haven't yet. And for just a few dollars a month, you can get a subscription account that gets you access to so much more. So please do yourself and me and them a favor and head over to describe.com slash D4. That's how they know that I sent you. Check them out. If you do decide to purchase a subscription, use the promo code D4 at checkout and you'll get 10% off. So that's cool. Big thanks to everyone at Describe. You guys are awesome. And let's jump into the build. All right. At level one, for our starting class, we're going Sorcerer. <laughs> you know, starting Sorcerer gives us some nice perks, uh, including Constitution saving throw proficiency, which is great for both the saving throws and for our concentration checks, of course. But we do have the smallest hit die in the game and zero armor proficiencies, so we are going to be pretty squishy on this character for most of our career. I mean, of course, you could always take like a single level dip here and start off as like, say, a fighter or maybe even an artificer to help out with that squishiness. But as always, when I'm building a character for damage, I really like to explore the limits of what's possible damage wise and beelining sorcerer levels, at least for a little while, is going to let us do a lot more and better burst damage on this character than getting distracted with any multi-classing. Fortunately, we're not planning on being in melee range if we can help it, so that should temper the squishiness a little bit. And of course, we will have some spells to help us out with our squishiness as well. As for the race, I'm actually, if you can believe it, going to recommend custom lineage today. <laughs> I took a really long break from custom lineage and variant human. It's been months. I know that you're so proud of me. But yes, today it's back. There are, of course, other options worth considering. I almost went goblin on this one, actually, but 
in the end there is a feat that i really wanted for this build and it really makes our early game a lot stronger if we can get it right at level one like we can with custom lineage if you do get a free feat at your table or you're just looking for an alternative i think i probably would go goblin here mostly for the fury of the small feature that they get which would give us a nice little bit of extra burst damage a few times a day but anyway as for the free feat that we get, I'm going to go with Fey Touched, as I often do. It's just, it's one of the best feats in the game, honestly, I think. You get a plus one to either your wisdom, intelligence, or charisma. Being a sorcerer, we'll take charisma, of course. And then you learn the Misty Step spell, and you can cast it once per day for free, uh, using spell slots thereafter, if you have them. That It's a second level spell, remember. And for a like squishy character who does not want to be in melee, this will be a very welcome boon to get you away from your enemies, among other things, and having it right at level one is gonna be really nice. And then we do get to also learn one first level spell of our choice that has to be from the divination or enchantment schools of magic. And the spell that I really wanna grab here is Bane, which is not typically available to sorcerers. I really love the Bane spell. I've used it in a couple of builds now. With Bane, you cast the spell as an action and then choose three targets more if you upcast it within 30 feet and then force a charisma saving throw which is typically the best saving throw for us to be targeting enemies with if they fail then for the next minute or until you lose your concentration of course they have to subtract a d4 from any attack or saving throw that they make so yeah kind of like the opposite of bless right this is really a pretty potent spell and probably doesn't get enough love in the D&D community, I think, sometimes. I'm actually planning on using our concentration for this spell for most of our character's career, at least when I crunch the numbers. Though there will, of course, be plenty of times that the situation will call for something else. Subtracting a d4 will very often be the difference between an enemy succeeding or failing on their attack against us, or, more importantly for us, succeeding or failing their saving throw. And as a burst damage spellcaster, we're going to be putting a lot of eggs in the basket of them failing their saving throw in order for us to do our burst damage, especially at higher levels. So having a nice way to lower their chance of success was really important to me on this character. As for our abilities, I assume that we're doing the point by method as always, and would suggest taking a 15 in charisma, taking our plus two from our racial bonus there, and of course the plus one from Faye Touched, letting us start with an 18 in charisma, and that's another really great reason to go custom lineage here. Um, but then taking a 14 in our constitution and a 14 in our dexterity. As for equipment, really just kind of standard stuff. We don't have any armor proficiencies. I'm not planning on using weapons, so just get your basic necessities and uh, maybe give any leftover money you might have to your friends. As a sorcerer at level one, of course, we do get our sorcerer subclass, our sorceress origin, and yes, we're going shadow magic. And since I've never used the shadow subclass before, that's exciting. Let's read what Wizards of the Coast has written about them. You are a creature of shadow, for your innate magic comes from the Shadowfell itself. You might trace your lineage to an entity from that place, or perhaps you were exposed to its fell energy and transformed by it. The power of shadow magic casts a strange pall over your physical presence. The spark of life that sustains you is muffled, as if it struggles to remain viable against the dark energy that imbues your soul. Ooh, creepy. <laughs> you are a sorcerer whose magic comes from the shadow fell, but you have also been touched by the fae. That is great fodder for an interesting backstory, I think. Was your heritage like a Romeo and Juliet-esque? origin? One parent from the Feywild and one from the Shadowfell, maybe? Star-crossed lovers who were fated to never find happiness together in this world? Yeah, that's a little cliche. You could probably do better. <laughs> I, I am curious to know how you might weave this story together. And I also really love the potential quirks that you get to choose from. There's a little list, right? Things like, uh, you're always cold to the touch. Your heart only beats once per minute. This event even surprises you sometimes. <laughs> That's funny. You blinked once last week. Lots of fun and pretty macabre and flavorful options to choose from here. I love it. I actually wish every subclass had a little thing like that, like the uh, Fey Wanderer Ranger and, and some others. It's just, it's a nice little bit of flair, flavor. 
as a shadow sorcerer, then we get a couple of pretty decent little features actually at level one. First up, Eyes of the Dark. This gives us dark vision out to 120 feet, and that's actually pretty amazing. And so make sure that you don't take dark vision. As a custom lineage character, you can choose between dark vision or proficiency, right? Take the proficiency. Also with Eyes of the Dark, at third level, we learn the darkness spell for free and can cast it either with a second level spell slot like normal or by spending two sorcery points. And when we cast it with sorcery points, we can then see in that magical darkness, similar to warlocks with their devil's sight invocation, right? Now, I'm not actually planning on making a lot of use of the darkness spell during our Nova round, though there are certainly some ways that you could build a character around being able to see in your own darkness spell, as I've done a few times, of course. Definitely take advantage of this perk when the situation calls for it. Keep in mind as well that when we do get sorcery points starting next level, we could turn a second level spell slot into two sorcery points. It takes a bonus action to do this, but if you're going to be casting darkness, it shouldn't cost you more than a second level spell regardless, right? Might as well convert the sorcery points if you can, and then just cast it with sorcery points so that you can see in that darkness. The other feature that we get as a sorcerer level one is Strength of the Grave. This tells us that once per day, when damage reduces you to zero hit points, you can make a charisma save with the DC being five plus the damage taken. And if we succeed on the save, we instead just drop to one hit point. It doesn't work if the damage is radiant or from a critical hit. And I mean, especially at lower levels, you should be able to make this save fairly consistently. As you level up and you start taking like, you know, 15 and 20 damage with consistency, it's gonna become less useful, obviously. But Still, it will save your life once in a while, and when it does, it'll feel awesome. Then we also get spells, of course, as a sorcerer, and there's actually a lot of spells that I would like to have here. Definitely get a nice cantrip for damage, like Firebolt, or maybe Ray of Frost, or maybe, just maybe, Poison Spray. I don't talk about this spell much because it has some big drawbacks. The range on it's only 10 feet and the enemy gets to make a constitution saving throw against it, which is usually the worst saving throw for us to be targeting. And if they fail, they take poison damage, which a lot of enemies are immune to in 5e. That said, it does more damage than any other cantrip, with maybe the exception of Toll the Dead, but we don't have access to Toll the Dead. It's a 1d12 of damage, and of course scales like all cantrips do, and Although that's not much more damage on average than say Firebolt's 1d10, later on we're actually going to like the fact that it's based on a saving throw as opposed to a spell attack. Anyway, take whatever other cantrips you like, but as for first level spells, I'd definitely grab shield for defensive purposes, raise your AC by five with your reaction, right? But I'd also get something that I don't really consider all that often, Mage Armor. Remember, with Mage Armor, it raises your armor class to 13 plus your dexterity modifier so long as you don't have any other armor. It lasts 8 hours and doesn't require concentration. Kind of a bummer to spend a first level spell slot for it every day. It's not amazing, but until we find a way to get armor proficiency, it's the best we've got. The other spell I will make special mention of here is Silvery Barbs. You know it, you love it, or, well, actually, you probably hate it. Yes. You. Um, Silvery Barbs lets us use our reaction to force an enemy who has succeeded on an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw to re-roll and then use that second roll. It's sort of like disadvantage, but specifically not disadvantage, and thus can stack if the enemy did have disadvantage on a thing, which is kind of nice. Sort of like the opposite of elven accuracy in that case, rolling up to three d20s in an attempt to get them to fail, right? And of course, if they are baned with our bane spell, they would be subtracting a d4 from any of those rolls that were attacks or saves, right? I'm really just trying to stack ways of ensuring enemy failure here. At this point, it feels a little bit like the re-roller build that we did a while ago, though we will be going in a very different direction ultimately. One other nice thing about Silvery Barbs, after using the spell, you give advantage to one ally or yourself, and then they get advantage on their next attack, save, or ability check made in the next minute. Finally, 
for spells, the highest damage single target spell to take here would be either Catapult or Chromatic Orb. So if you're looking for burst damage here early on, those will be your go-to options. Both do 3d8 damage, though Catapult allows for a dex save, so it might be better for us, at least later. And with Chromatic Orb, you're making a spell attack. At level 2 we get Font of Magic, we get our sorcery points, right? We get one per level of sorcerer, and for now we can just use them to convert into additional spell slots, or vice versa, but we don't really have anything to spend those points on currently, so convert them into additional spell slots. But at level three, we get Meta Magic, and can then use those sorcery points for other things. And there are so many wonderful ways to enhance our spells with Meta Magic. I would love to have careful spell so we could say cast an area of effect spell and let our allies automatically succeed on the save against it. Extended spell would be fantastic to double the duration of a spell that you've cast. Would be really handy for mage armor, taking it from 8 hours to 16 hours, and that makes me feel like we could sort of more reliably count on having it for an entire adventuring day. But I think that the two that I would go with here, because we only get to choose two, for now would be quicken spell as usual so we could spend two sorcery points to cast a spell that usually has a casting time of an action as a bonus action i just find this so incredibly useful and powerful in game though admittedly it is stronger on a character who either has a really strong cantrip option since you can't cast a spell as a bonus action and then another spell with your action unless it's a cantrip or on a character who has a really strong weapon attack or is doing something else super important or useful with their action. That's not really us, so we don't benefit quite as much as other builds do here, I think, though we will make use of it at least early on. The other one that I think I would take here would actually be Empowered Spell, which I've never really used in a build before. Empowered Spell lets us spend one little sorcery point to re-roll our Charisma modifier in dice, so that's four currently, when we roll damage for a spell. And considering that we're going for big burst damage here and using spells to get it, being able to re-roll, say, any like ones or twos or whatever that we rolled on our spell will allow us to to eke a little more damage out of those burst damage spells. It won't be a ton, but since I'm always trying to explore the limit of what's possible, I think I'd take it in this scenario. But yes, of course, we also do get second level spells here as well. And yeah, you should pick up web and consider vortex warp and hold person and things. But the one that I will make special mention of here is scorching ray, as that's going to be our best single target burst damage option for our second level spell slots, which we made great use of, I think, with our flamethrower build here. And I think that's my last card that I can link to today. Anyway, with Scorching Ray, you shoot three rays of fire at one or multiple targets if you prefer, making a spell attack roll for each ray, doing 2d6 with each of them when they hit. At level four, we get our first ability score increase or feat, and I think we got a bump charisma. It affects our damage more than anything else, and that would cap us at 20, and it feels awesome to be capped by level four, right? Mm-mm, yummy. At level five, we get third level spells. And I mean, third level spells are the best, or as they say in France, le best. <laughs> I think it's actually le meilleur. Anyway, for sure, pick up spells like Counterspell, Dispel Magic, Fear, Fly, Hypnotic Pattern, but the one I'm going to say we definitely need to grab here is actually Lightning Bolt. I know, weird, right? Here's the thing. Even though it potentially does damage to multiple targets, it's actually also the highest single target damage spell we can cast with our third level spell slot. Along with Fireball, of course, both of which do 8d6 damage if the enemy fails their dexterity saving throw, or half if they succeed. Now, most of the time, people prefer Fireball to Lightning Bolt because it's usually easier to get multiple enemies in a 20-foot radius sphere with Fireball than it is a 5-foot wide, 100-foot long line like with Lightning Bolt. But the next level, we're going to get our Hound of Ill Omen, and that's going to ideally always be right next to our enemy. Now, it's possible that we could position a fireball just so, right, and avoid hitting our hound with it, but still hitting the enemy. But 
depending on the room, depending on where your other allies are, I just feel a little safer relying on Lightning Bolt for damage here, personally. And besides, I'm wearing my God of Thunder t-shirt. So lightning it is. Feel free to grab both lightning bolt and fireball and use whichever one is right for the situation that you're in. But yes, at level six, we do as a shadow sorcerer get our Hound of Ill Omen feature. With Hound of Ill Omen, as a bonus action, we can spend three sorcery points and that's half of our sorcery points currently. So to summon a medium sized monstrosity within 120 feet of us and basically sick them on a single enemy. The hound uses the stats of the dire wolf. It has temporary hit points equal to half of our sorcerer level. It can move through other creatures and objects as, as if they were difficult terrain. And it knows the location of their target even if they were hidden. It has its own initiative and can only move toward their target by the most direct route and can only use their action to attack their target. So just a little heat seeking doggy missile. It can make opportunity attacks against their target as well, but only against their target, right? Also, so, while they are within five feet of their target, the target has disadvantage against saving throws versus spells that you cast. It disappears if it drops to zero hit points, or after five minutes, or when their target dies. Honestly, kind of like I alluded to at the beginning, the Hound is my favorite feature of this subclass. I mean, the other stuff is cool, but this is a really unique feature, not because it lets you summon a pet that can attack your enemies. There are lots of ways to do that in D&D 5e, right? No, the thing that I love the most about it and that I most wanted to build this character around was the disadvantage on saving throws bit. That's really quite powerful and has had me scouring the spell list for the best burst damage spells out there that require saving throws, dictating almost every decision that I've made regarding this character. I love it. And I want to amplify the power that it gives us as much as I possibly can. As for the Hound itself, it's decently tanky, at least for this level. It has a 14 armor class and 37 hit points plus three temporary hit points currently, so 40 total basically. And it's not bad. They only have a plus five to hit and then do 2d6 plus three damage on a hit, so nothing amazing. But they do have pack tactics, meaning that if they're attacking an enemy, that standing within five feet of another one of our allies, they have advantage. One more reason not to go fireball, I think, since ideally we'll be attacking an enemy that's standing next to both our hound and another party member, and that just gets really difficult to not hit friendlies, right? If the hound succeeds on their attack, the enemy has to make a strength save with a DC of only 13, not huge, but if they fail it, they're gonna be knocked prone. There's a decent likelihood that most enemies will succeed here, at least at higher levels, but it'll still be great once in a while. The one thing that I don't really love about the Hound is that it just doesn't scale hardly at all, aside from the additional temporary hit points, which are not a lot. So at higher levels, the damage that we get from it will become less and less, and its survivability will get worse and worse. But of course, if a high level enemy is wasting their turn trying to kill your Hound, even if they succeed, that's still a win. Anyway, the lack of scaling feels like a bit of an oversight on Wizards of the Coast part to me, but we can deal with it. Okay, so at level six, it's time for our first damage report. Let's talk about how I think everything would play out in like a best case scenario. On round one, I am gonna take a little time for setup. You don't have to. You could just summon your hound and shoot a lightning bolt, right? But since we're spending three sorcery points for the hound and one of our very few third level spell slots here, I really wanna do all I can to get as much out of our Nova round as possible. So yeah, let's see how far we can stretch things with a, with a round of setup. And yes, to be clear, I'm not necessarily recommending that you always do everything that I'm going to tell you to do here. Just exploring the possible if we wanted to burn lots of our resources in a single glorious round of Nova damage. So yes, on round one, let's use our bonus action to summon our Hound right next to our target and then cast Bane with our action. It's not doing any damage, but it is a decent debuff that will affect multiple enemies and thereby help multiple party members. 
I don't feel bad using the spell on round one at all before we go Nova. And our target, at least, is very likely to fail their saving throw against Bane with disadvantage and it being a charisma save and, you know, even having silvery barbs as a backup just in case. But then on round two is when we go Nova. We use Quicken Spell to hurl a lightning bolt at our enemy as a bonus action, then follow up with a poison spray if we're close enough, or like a firebolt otherwise. We could even use our last, yes, we'd only have one left at this point if we used Quicken Spell and summoned our Hound, uh, our last sorcery point to use Empowered Spell on that Lightning Bolt if we wanted, you know, rerolling now five of the eight D6s that we rolled for Lightning Bolt, if we got like a bunch of ones or something. I'm not going to assume we're doing that when I crunch the numbers, just because figuring out the math on how it would actually impact the numbers would take too much time and I'm probably not smart enough to do it right anyway. <laughs> but assuming our hound is next to the enemy at this point and you know hasn't been killed or anything and our bane spell stuck, the enemy would have both disadvantage on their saving throws and would have to subtract a d4 from their saves. So unless they're immune or have resistance to poison or have a ridiculously high plus to their constitution saving throw, we'll likely get better damage out of poison spray here than firebolt. I'm going to assume that we're using it feel free to go another route if you want, temper the numbers slightly. Anyway, if everything sticks, including our Hound's attack, we would be doing 2d12 for Poison Spray at this level, 8d6 for Firebolt, and another 2d6 plus 3 from our Hound. And yes, I am going to assume pack tactics are in effect, so the Hound has advantage. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus 0 to their saving throws, we would do 51 damage on average, and against an enemy with a 15 armor class and a plus 5 to their saves, it's 46 damage. And compared to other burst damage builds that I've done to date, check in the video description to see those comparisons and graphs and spreadsheets, that's about middle of the pack, tier 2, at this level. Not amazing, not bad. Could be a little better if we used Empowered Spell, and... Also, keep in mind that you do have the potential to do a lot more total damage if you're hitting multiple enemies with that lightning bolt or fireball, right? So I do feel like we're sandbagging things just a little bit here, and that's fine. Now, some of you may be asking, when is he going to take fighter levels? <laughs> because as most of us know, the easiest, most reliable way to cast two leveled spells, right, non-cantrip spells, in a single turn is via action surge, via two levels of fighter. So if we're going for burst damage, shouldn't we prioritize that? Well, here's the thing. While yes, being able to cast what would at this level be two scorching rays against a single target here, had we gone fighter two, sorcerer four, right? That would be nice. We wouldn't have our hound attack. We wouldn't have the higher damage lightning bolt spell or the ability to also throw out a cantrip on our turn. And so all told, the burst damage that we would get at this level would actually be worse with Action Surge and only four levels of Sorcerer, even during our Nova round. Thus, the wisdom in doing the math. Of course, being able to start off with armor proficiency and a fighting style would be really nice. So again, feel free to go that route if you'd like. As for us, we're really happy to just be a straight Sorcerer for now. At level 7, we get 4th level spells. And yeah, grab your polymorph and your banishment and your dimension door and greater invisibility and wall of fire. Lots of great options. The one I would highlight here for single target burst damage is Blight, another spell that you don't actually hear much about usually. At this level, it does 8d8 necrotic damage to a single target. That's kind of a lot. The big drawback is that the enemy gets to make a constitution saving throw against it. But with disadvantage and bane on them, plus again, silvery barbs potentially if we need it, I like our chances of having it do full damage against most targets. And of course, they will still take half damage even if they succeed on their saving throw. Another little bonus, if you cast this on a plant creature or a magical plant, the spell does maximum damage. I hope you get to play in a Little Shop of Horrors-esque homebrew world. Um, of course, you know, if you can hit multiple targets with it, feel free to upcast Lightning Bolt or Fireball instead. The damage that it does even to a single target isn't that much less with 96. At level 8, we get another ability score increase or feat, and I think if it were me, with our charisma capped, 
I'd honestly probably just be looking to shore up my defenses with all of my ability score increases and feats from this point on. You could definitely take Resilient Wisdom and give yourself proficiency in Wisdom saving throws. Not a bad option. Um, you could take the Tough feat for more hit points or even Warcaster for advantage on your concentration checks, among other things. Lucky, never a bad option. I think for me, I'd probably bump Constitution, giving me both additional hit points and improving my Constitution and Concentration saves, right? So that would put us at a 16 Constitution now, which is not bad. At level 9, we get 5th level spells. Ah, the almighty 5th level spells. Now, Sorcerers don't get Wall of Force, unfortunately, but you do still have Hold Monster, Synaptic Static, Dominate Person, Wall of Stone. The only one that I'll highlight for damage here is actually Animate Objects. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, but just in case you aren't, it's a potentially devastating spell, arguably a little overpowered. As an action and with concentration, so you wouldn't be able to use Bane, right? But you bring to life a number of non-magical objects, and that's important, so no animating any like plus one daggers or anything. And those objects can be in size from tiny to huge, but the smaller the object, the more of them you can animate. So generally, for damage at least, you're best off with 10 tiny objects, which is what you would get. And then with a bonus action, you can command the objects to do something. Generally, that something is attack whatever I'm trying to kill or something like that. And thereafter, they should just obey your command each round without you having to continue to use your bonus action to command them. Though I have seen some DMs that require a bonus action every turn to get them to do something. Make sure you check with yours. The tiny objects though have a pretty impressive plus 8 to hit and then do 1d4 plus 4 damage each. And when you've got 10 of them, that's quite a bit of damage. Situationally, it's going to be your best single target damage spell right now. And the nice thing is you could do it round after round, so it's both like burst and sustainable. There are two potentially big drawbacks to animate objects, however. One, they are of course subject to area of effect damage spells that could just wipe out the lot of them as they only have 20 hit points. Two, though, more importantly, there's nothing inherent in the spell that says the damage these animated objects do would be considered magical for the sake of overcoming resistance to non-magical attacks. Now, I've seen some DMs say that the damage is considered magical since they're empowered by a magical spell, right? But the consensus seems to be, including from Mike Merle, one of the original designers of 5e, that they are not considered magical damage. We're level 9. A lot of enemies are going to have resistance to non-magical damage, and that's only going to increase as we gain levels. If they do have resistance, we will be better off sticking with Blight here for pure damage on our Nova round. Of course, if you really wanted to be crazy and blow way too many resources, I suppose you could cast Animate Objects and use that for your concentration and then hit them with a fourth level Blight spell. So yeah, just in time for our level 9 damage report, let's do that. <laughs> Let's, let's be stupid. Yeah, round one, cast animate objects, use your bonus action to command them to attack your target, and then on round two, our Nova round, pull out your hound with your bonus action, cast Blight at the fourth level. Your animated objects wouldn't have advantage on their attacks, but I will assume that your hound still does, and now you could park your objects next to the enemy, guaranteeing pack tactics for the hound at least. And now the enemy at least would still have disadvantage on their save versus Blight, though no Bane to subtract the d4, and for that reason, you know, feel free to go Lightning Bolt here as it's a deck save rather than con, right? Like I say, the damage isn't that much less, you might be able to hit another enemy or two. But anyway, assuming Blight, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their saves, we would do on average 109 damage during our Nova round here, and against an enemy with a 16 armor class and a plus six to their saves, that's 83 damage, and again, I'm also assuming that the enemy does not have resistance to non-magical damage, right? So, a lot of assumptions here, I know, but hey, we broke the Centennial Barrier, I'm happy about that, and compared to other Nova builds, we're kind of closer to the upper end of Tier 2 at this level now, so that's cool. At level 10, we get a third metamagic option, and I think 
I would probably go with Twin Spell now here. It's not necessarily a no-brainer. The other options are still good, but Twin Spell is potentially really powerful. It's also potentially really expensive. You spend a number of sorcery points equal to the level of the spell you're casting, one if it's a cantrip, and you can target a second creature with the spell, provided that it's only capable of targeting one creature normally. So yes, you could Twin Blight, for example. If you wanted to spend the sorcery points, I don't know that I would, except in the rarest of circumstances, as spending four or even five, if you upcast it, points to hit two targets with this spell feels a little overpriced when you could probably do almost as much damage and hit maybe even more targets with, say, a lightning bolt or a fireball. Twin spell is really fun, though, to use for buffs like haste, among other things. Anyway, there is a spell that I think just might be worth spending the points to twin for damage coming up soon, though. So let's talk about it, because at level 11, we would get 6th level spells. And sure, Chain Lightning is a pretty potent spell for damage on multiple targets. Mass Suggestion is an incredible spell for controlling the battlefield. But sometimes you just want to blow up a single target. And for that purpose, there are few spells better than the infamous Disintegrate. You know, I've never really used this spell in a build before either. And I suppose that's not all that surprising since, well, first of all, I don't actually get to level six spells on a ton of builds. And when I do, they're rarely single target Nova damage spellcaster builds. And by rarely, I think I mean never. <laughs> So yeah, I'm kind of excited to work this in here. And it is kind of the main thing that I've been beelining for all this time, actually. Disintegrate is just so cool and so much fun. You point at a target and shoot a thin green ray at them. They have to make a dexterity saving throw or take 10 10D6 D6 plus 40, 40 force, damage. force damage. And if it reduces them to zero hit points, they're just disintegrated and can only be brought back to life with a true resurrection or wish spell. You can also use it against objects or even other spells that can't otherwise be removed with dispel magic like Wall of Force. It also scales quite nicely, going up by 3d6 for every level that you upcast it. Now, there is one huge drawback to Disintegrate, and it is this. If the enemy makes that dexterity saving throw, it does zero damage. Ouch. So definitely don't use this against enemies with legendary saves, right? This, I think, is the biggest reason that people shy away from Disintegrate and why I haven't used it in a build before. But on the Shadow Sorcerer, who's both getting disadvantage on saving throws and forcing the enemy to subtract a d4 from their saves and potentially holding a silvery barbs in reserve just in case, I think it is a perfect fit. Now that we've finally gotten that ultimate single target burst damage spell, it might be time to finally do what you probably all expected me to do a long time ago and take some fighter levels. <laughs> you certainly don't have to. If you wanted to build this as a straight sorcerer, you absolutely could. You know, delaying your higher level spell slots as well as some fun sorcerer and shadow sorcerer features isn't a no brainer. I mean, Taking fighter levels here is going to mean, among other things, that we're not going to get to Meteor Swarm on this build. That makes me sad. On the other hand, if you do plan on taking fighter levels at some point, I think, like I said at the beginning, you'd be perfectly justified in doing so early on. Starting out this character with more hit points, armor proficiencies, and a fighting style would have been really nice for our survivability all along. Would have been worse for our burst damage, and since that's what I'm trying to build for, well, you know me. So, take fighter levels early, don't take fighter levels at all, but for us, we're going fighter now. And as such, we do pick up medium armor and shield proficiency. Remember, you only get heavy armor proficiency if you start as a fighter, right? But we probably wouldn't have wanted heavy armor anyway, since our strength score would mean that we'd have a 10-foot move speed penalty. Anyway, assuming that we just equip half plate and a shield at this level, our AC goes from a 15 with mage armor to a 19, and that feels way better. And we also get a fighting style, and I'd probably take the defense fighting style here, giving us another plus one for 20 AC, and that's good. 
for a sorcerer, especially. Um, you know, you could consider other options. Interception would be nice to help protect our allies, but between the shield spell, silvery barbs, and counter spell, I think I'm going to want to hold on to my reaction to use it when I need it. So interception isn't great. And I mean, especially since we're ranged, we might not be near allies very often to use it anyway. We also do, as a fighter one, get second wind, which lets us use our bonus action to recover some hit points once per short rest. At level 13, we would be a fighter too, and yes, we get action surge. That's the real reason that we're here in fighter in the first place. It's just a really difficult ability to ignore when you're building a character for burst damage. Because, as I've said, it would let us cast two spell slotted spells on our turn, since we can potentially get two actions on our turn with this feature once per short rest. And that is going to do amazing things for our Nova round, especially now that we have some really potent spells to be casting. I think we start off the same way that we did early on now with Bane and our Hound, but then on our Nova round, we would simply hit our enemy with Disintegrate, potentially twinning it onto another target if we wanted, Action Surge, and then hit the enemy with an upcast Blight spell at the fifth level if we were willing to blow the resources. Assuming we are, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their saving throws, we would do 125 damage on average. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class and a plus seven to their saves, it would be 109. And so while that's still nice, we've actually slipped just a skosh compared to other Nova builds at this level, putting us closer to like the bottom of tier two now. And yet, we have all the versatility and options at our disposal of being a caster with access to sixth level spells. So it's nothing to be ashamed of. And when you twin disintegrate and turn two enemies to dust on the same turn, you will feel godly. At level 14, I think we go back to Sorcerer though now and stay there for the rest of our career. We don't need any more martial training with the power of shadow and the cosmos at our fingertips, right? So we would be a Sorcerer 12 and we would get another ability score increase or feat. Again, I think I just continue to bolster our defenses here and, you know, probably bump my constitution again, taking it to an 18, though again, the other options we discussed last time would still be viable. At level 15, we would be a Sorcerer 13 and we get 7th level spells. That means Reverse Gravity, and Teleport, and Firestorm, and others, and they're all potentially fun and useful, but the one that I will highlight here is actually another that I don't think I've ever used in a build before, Crown of Stars. I love this spell. Or, at least, I think I would if I ever got to use it in-game. <laughs> See, you'll notice that now that we have Action Surge, we're not actually using our bonus action during our Nova round, right? Because if we were to quicken a spell and cast it as a bonus action, then we could only cast cantrips with our action. And we're just better off damage-wise casting two big spells with an action surge than we are with, say, one big spell with quicken spell, and then, like, two cantrips with action surge, right? Enter Crown of Stars. Takes an action to cast, which is a bummer, but it lasts for an hour without concentration. So I'm going to assume next time I crunch numbers that we have this active, but of course, you know, you're only going to want to cast it if you know combat is coming up within the next hour. And once you have it up, you get seven star-like motes of light that orbit your head. And I love this image actually on a shadow sorcerer. Would you be annoyed by them squinting at the bright light they cast? Oh, why do I always cast this spell? Or would you flavor them as like motes of darkness, black holes instead of stars, maybe? Anyway, on your turn, once you've got it up, you can use a bonus action to cause one of the seven motes to streak towards a target. You make a spell attack and do 4d12 radiant damage on a hit. Super cool, super fun. At level 16, we would be a Sorcerer 14, and we get probably the coolest, most fun and flavorful shadow sorcerer feature, uh, shadow walk. It's a shame that it comes so late. With shadow walk, when you're in dim light or darkness, as a bonus action, you can teleport up to 120 feet to another area that is also in dim light or darkness that you can see. So similar to um, the shadow monk's shadow step. What's extra cool for us is that if you're in dim light or darkness, but where you want to teleport to is not, or vice versa, you can always cast the darkness spell with sorcery points, meaning you can see in and through the darkness and then use it for teleportation purposes. The range of the darkness spell is only 60 feet, 
but if you took the distant spell metamagic option, you could double that, throw it out to 120 feet, which is the range of your teleport. But finally, for us, at level 17, we would be a sorcerer 15, and we get 8th level spells. I mean, you should probably get and use Dominate Monster to just straight up mind control anything that fails their wisdom save against the spell. But I'm going to pretend that we are using that spell slot for an upcast disintegrate spell, so PYF. Pick your favorite. For our final damage report then, I'm going to assume that we've got Crown of Stars active, just for fun, still using Bane and Hound, then on our Nova round hitting our target with Disintegrate at the 8th level, using Action Surge and hitting Disintegrate at the 6th level, and then using our bonus action for a Crown of Stars moat attack. With all of that together, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus 0 to their saving throws, we would do on average 207 damage. And against an enemy with an 18 armor class and a plus 8 to their saves, it would be 173. I'm really happy to have broken the bicentennial barrier here. And so, compared to other Nova builds, at this level, we're kind of back in the middle of the pack, tier 2. Alright, let's talk about final thoughts. The tier score for this character, when you average all of the damage that they do at all of the armor classes that we calculate for at each of the damage reports, is 102. And surprising no one, that puts us kind of right in the middle of tier 2 compared to other Nova damage builds. And yeah, this build was a lot of fun. I, I so rarely take casters to this high of level, which probably surprises some of my newer viewers since the consensus out there in the D&D community is that casters are far superior to martial characters in 5e. And I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, for the record. Or I suppose it just all depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I generally like to mix up my characters with a little of both, as you've no doubt noticed. And hopefully to great effect. But as for this character, I really love the feel of the Shadow Sorcerer. Dark, brooding, deathly. And I can't really imagine building a dark, brooding, and deathly spellcaster and then just have them spend most of their spell slots, like, not trying to kill things. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. But, you know, in my opinion, if you want to make a character who uses their spell slots to control their enemies on the battlefield, make an enchanter wizard or something like it, right? I don't have any cards left. Look it up. Control Freak. It was a good one. But sorcerers are for blowing stuff up. They're blasters, right? And few can do it better, in my opinion, than the Shadow Sorcerer. So that's the build for the week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. More than that, I hope you know how much I love you, because I do, and you're awesome. So thank you for watching. I hope you'll check out the other content in the channel if you don't typically do so, and that you like and subscribe and comment. But more than anything, I hope you have a fantastic day and a great week, and that you stay safe, and that you be good and kind, and that I see you again very soon. So until then, take care. Oh, what a beautiful morning, oh, what a beautiful day, I've got a beautiful feeling, everything's going my way. It is early, and I am not really a morning person, but apparently my brain has forgotten how to sleep in lately, so I'm just channeling my best Ted Lasso energy right now. High five, tree, all right. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Pretty impressive, plus it's so it's You know, I always figured that tea was just gonna taste like hot brown water. And you know what? I was right. This is disgusting, no thank you. <laughs> oh, such a good show. Here's a little trivia for you. Favorite superhero of all time. Yeah, it's Thor. Not really sure why. I think probably because my grandpa was from Sweden. And my last name is Swedish in origin. So I've always been kind of really into like the whole Scandinavian mythology thing.
And the way that they're doing Thor in the Marvel Cinematic Universe lately just really has solidified that for me. He's the best. I can't wait for Love and Thunder. It's going to be awesome. Plus, I like lightning. If you do decide to purchase a description, <laughs> oh, what are they called? Like the Fey, 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 Wanderer. Do 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 do. Probably make sure you you start off with an odd number. Don't even say that. <laughs> Does my face look like it's in the mood for shape-based jokes right now? No, Roy, it does not. But in my defense, it rarely does. <laughs>